My name is Barry Cole, the pastor here at Aviano Baptist Church. And on behalf of our church community, let me just say welcome. We're glad you joined us today. And regardless of your background or where you are in your relationship with Jesus, maybe you're still seeking, and frankly, you've got more questions than answers about him. Or maybe you've been walking with him a few years or even for a long time. And your desire is to know him better, to grow in your relationship with him. And regardless of where you are on that spectrum, what we want you to know is you're welcome here. There's a place for you here at Aviano Baptist Church. Because our desire as a church community is to love Jesus more and to lead more to love Jesus. Now, if that sounds like the church for you, we invite you to pull up a chair and let's spend these next several moments and worship our amazing Lord together. Sunday to you, ABC family. I hope you had a great week. This announcement this morning is a special announcement specifically for our virtual audience. If you've been joining our virtual service for these last several months, what a blessing it's been, right? 
And I know I saw many of the notes that you shared with Rachel Oden over this time expressing your appreciation for the work that she's done week after week to put this service together. And I encourage you to continue to do that. But, you know, things are starting to open back up again. And our favorite restaurants are open and many of our favorite coffee bars and travel destinations. I know many of you are on the road this weekend, this 4th of July weekend. But even in the midst of that, there are many families that have some legitimate health and safety concerns about the idea of being around large crowds of people. And for you, I want to reiterate what I said the first Sunday we reopened, that you have to make the best decision that you can for the health and safety of your family. And we respect that. And so there's nobody in your ABC family that's going to look down on you or think less of you or judge you or question your spirituality if you choose to stay virtual for those reasons for now. But I also know that there are a lot of families who don't have those concerns. And, and we're freely getting out and going places to malls and to restaurants and to beaches. And so the rest of this message really is for that group. I want to encourage you not to let virtual church become a part of your new normal. This has been great, and I've seen a lot of you, even when you're traveling, connecting to the virtual service. That's why we've had a YouTube presence for several years now. And I encourage you to do that if you're on the road, if you can't make it to church. But there's something we miss. As good as our virtual service is, there's something we miss in the virtual experience. The author of Hebrews said this in Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm reading this out of the Good News Bible. He said, let us not give up the habit of meeting together, as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more, and since you see that, the day of the Lord is coming nearer and nearer. You know, when we come together face to face, we have the opportunity to see a smile, even under a mask, from a friend we haven't seen in a while. Or we have a chance to go up and give a, a fist bump or an elbow bump to someone we haven't seen. We have the opportunity to look a friend directly in the eyes and say, how are you doing? And so I encourage you, if you can, if you don't have health concerns, to make coming back to face-to-face -to -face church that part of your new normal. Our children's ministry is opening back up. It's open back up starting this Sunday. And you can sign up for the slots for your kids to be in that at the same time you save your seat for the Sunday morning service. And then to make things easier, starting next Sunday on the 12th of July, we're going to open up the cry room again. COVID rules apply, so it'll be on a limited basis. It'll be only during the 915 service. We'll have it available for preschool age and below children. And of course, we have to limit the number of people in there. Two adults and or four kids. Now, we're not going to have an RSVP for that, so it'll be sort of self-policing. And so parents, when you go down there, if you see there are two parents or you see there are four kids, just bring your littles back up into the sanctuary. They're welcome with us here in the service. They might be squirmy. They might make a little bit of noise, but that's okay. They're children. We understand. I hope we'll see you back at church very soon, starting next Sunday so that we can have the opportunity to encourage one another and support one another as a church community. Now, I spent a lot of time on that announcement this morning. I thought it was important, and we needed to, to talk about that. And so I encourage you to check out that announcement email that showed up in your inbox. Click the link on the Facebook page or click the link in WhatsApp. You'll find a lot of good information, a lot of stuff that's happening in these coming weeks. A pastor's Bible study that I'm going to be starting here in a couple of weeks. Information about a church fundraising campaign that's coming up very soon. A lot of service opportunities. We're going to be talking about those here in a few minutes in the, in the message. And so check that out. When we get done the service today, check out that email. Stay plugged in. See what's going on. Well, we're glad you're here today. We're glad you joined us, even virtually in the virtual service. And now as we enter our time of virtual greeting, as we've been doing for the last several weeks either in the comment section below or the chat section off to the side. Type a quick word of greeting to your church family. Let them know you're here. Let them know you're glad to be worshiping with them. And as you're doing that, let's continue in our time of worship.
spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, There's a story of a little girl who was talking to her teacher about the story of Jonah and the whale in the Bible. 
Now, I know that the Bible doesn't say it was a whale. It says it was a great fish, but, but bear with me for the sake of the story. And her teacher said, you know, even though whales are very big, they have a very small throat, so it's physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human being. And the little girl replied, and she said, well, the Bible says that a whale swallowed Jonah. The Bible says it. I believe it. And the teacher said, well, I don't believe the Bible then. If it says this about Jonah, it's physically impossible. So if the Bible says this, then it simply can't be true. And the little girl said, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah. And her teacher said, well, what if Jonah didn't go to heaven? And the little girl said, well, then you ask him. Obviously, our next hero of the faith that we're looking at this morning is Jonah. So take out your Bible or open up the Bible app on your device. Join me in Jonah chapter 1. I mentioned last week, if you have a hard time knowing the books of the Bible, to find a little children's song that teaches the books. Jonah is in the section of the Old Testament called the Minor Prophets. Not minor because the stuff that they wrote was less significant. Minor because they have a lot less material than some of the prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah. And you get to that section and not a lot of people spend a lot of time in the Minor Prophets. And so it's hard to, to know where those books are. But that song rings in my head every time I come to hear Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. So turn there toward the end of the Old Testament to the book of Jonah. There are a lot of lessons that we can learn from the book of Jonah. And if you spent any time in church, if you grew up in church, you've been in children's Sunday school, if you've been in our amazing children's ministry, you, your children have learned the story of Jonah. Ask your kids, they'll tell you. In fact, I encourage you after the service to have a discussion, talk about Jonah. Have it, spend that time talking about the Bible, how it applies to your life. One of the biggest lessons is that Jonah is a story about the will of God and how we respond to it. And it's also a story about the love of God and how we share it with others. And I want us to think about this morning Jonah as a reluctant servant. And here's the big idea in the story of Jonah. That God wants to use us in his kingdom, despite our limitations, and sometimes because of them. Now you've got your Bible open to Jonah chapter 1. Just follow along. I'm going to read the first 17 verse. Well, at least the entire chapter. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa and found a ship which was going to Tarshish. He paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord hurled a great wind onto the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. And the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God. And they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, and he laid down and, fe and fell fast asleep. So the captain approached him, and he said, How is it that you're sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we won't perish. And each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What, from what are your people? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And then the man, men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was hiding from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And so they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea had become increasingly stormy. And he said, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately 
to return to land, for, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. And then they called on the Lord. They said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, don't let us perish on account of this man's life. Don't put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. And so they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea and the sea stopped its raging. And then the men feared the Lord greatly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Pray with me this morning. Father, once again, we come before you just absolutely desperate for a touch. This is a story we've all heard many, many times, Lord, and we don't want to get complacent about it. We want our hearts to be challenged as we read it. And so, Father, as you teach us about Jonah, your reluctant servant, teach our hearts about us and how in, in many ways we are reluctant servants. And Father, would you just teach us these next few moments and help our hearts to respond to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want us to look at this story of Jonah. I want us to see how God wants to use us in his kingdom, not only despite our limitations, but because of them. And the first thing I, I want us to see is this, that God called Jonah to work. The story begins when God calls Jonah to a task. Now, Jonah is a prophet, and so this task should suit him. He should be excited about this task. Because this is what prophets did in the Old Testament. They preached judgment to sinful people. That's exactly what God called Jonah to do. I think he should have been excited, too, about the implications of the task. Jonah was a contemporary of two other of the minor prophets, Amos and Hosea. God had prophesied through Amos and told them that he was going to carry the nation of Israel off into exile because of their sin. And then he told them through the prophet Hosea that specifically it would be the nation of Assyria that would do it. Nineveh, where Jonah was sent to preach, was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. You see, Jonah was in a unique position. To see maybe not only 120,000 people, the citizens of Nineveh, to not only see them turn to God, but maybe to change the hearts of the scariest enemy of God's people at that time. You would think Jonah would be excited because of the implications of this. He should have seen the blessing of his task, but he didn't. And many times we're like that too. God calls us to his work because like in Jonah's life, he wants us to share in the blessings. And I think many times we as believers, we need to get our heads around the fact that God doesn't need us. He doesn't need me to preach his word. He doesn't need you to do anything. God doesn't need anything. But yet he chooses to use us and we need to get our heads around. That God is inviting us to be a part of something great that he's doing here in this community and around the world. And he's asking us to be a part of that. John chapter 4 verses 35 and 36, Jesus said this. He said, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they're white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. God sows the seeds in this community. His Holy Spirit goes out and sows the seeds. He asks us to help scatter those seeds. And we're blessed to be a part of that. Then we're also blessed to be a part of the harvest. And he calls us to a task because he wants us to share in the blessing. And God put this church right here, Aviano Baptist, and he brought you to be a part of it. Now, don't think those two things were an accident. He did that so that he can send us out into the Aviano community and out into other places around the world with his message of hope. And everybody has a part to play in the work that God is doing. 
As we read the story of Jonah, everybody plays a part. The ship captain has a part. He's the one that goes down below and wakes Jonah up. What are you doing? Get up. The sailors have a part. They're the ones that throw Jonah into the water so that the fish can swallow him. Even the fish in the story has a part. And if God will use pagans, pagan ship captain, a bunch of pagan sailors, if God will use them, if he'll use a fish, well, how much more does he want to use his own children? And each one of us plays a part. Paul said this, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He said, but to each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. God gives each of us a gift, a spiritual gift, which is nothing more than an ability he wants us to use. And he gives that to us, not for our own good, but for the common good, for the good of the church community, for the good of the community that he's placed us in. God called Jonah to his work, and he calls each of us to his work. And he gives us a part to play because he wants to share in the blessings of what he's doing. And so that's the first thing we see about the story of Jonah is that God called Jonah to a task. And, but God called Jonah despite Jonah's limitations. You know, the more you come to know about Jonah, the more that you come to read the story, the more you realize there were a lot of reasons that God shouldn't have called Jonah. The most obvious, of course, is how Jonah reacted. Verse 2, God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Verse 3 says, but that's not what Jonah did. And that's the most obvious limitation, the most obvious reason God shouldn't have called Jonah. But he had other limitations. He was a coward. Verse 5 said he jumps on the ship and he immediately goes below to hide. He's selfish, self-centered. Here, they're in the middle of this storm. The ship is breaking up, and it's all happening because of him, and he knows it. And he's down below, completely unconcerned, couldn't care less. And we learn over in chapter 4 that Jonah's got a bitter spirit. He, he's got an unforgiving heart. Yeah, there were a lot of reasons why God shouldn't have called Jonah for this task. But in a lot of ways, Jonah laid out all of his limitations before God. This is what it says over in Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He said, but it greatly displeased Jonah. Now that was after the nation of Nineveh had turned and repented. And Jonah said this to God. Was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? God, I told you. I'm the wrong guy for this. Pick somebody else. I've got too many limitations. I don't want to do this. And many of us are the same way. God calls us to a task just like he's called Jonah. He calls us to a task and we give God our list of limitations. But here's what we have to realize. That what seem like limitations to us are nothing but openings for God's glory. This is what the Apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. I just want you to listen to these words. Paul addresses the church there and he says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential, not many of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. One of the lessons throughout Scripture, you see it over and over and over again. We're looking at these heroes of the faith. And one of the things you can't escape, you can't miss in all of those stories, is that God often calls the least likely candidate. We didn't get to look at him, but God called Moses. Moses had a list of limitations. 
You move forward, and we, we've talked about David. And God called David, and David had limitations. Ruth had limitations. Jonah has them. God often calls the least likely candidate. So that when we see limitations, he has opportunities to shine for his glory. God called Jonah to a task. He called Jonah despite his limitations. And I believe that he called Jonah because of his limitations. It wasn't just despite them that God said, listen, you see limitations, but I'm bigger than all of those. God called them specifically, he called Jonah, because of those limitations that Jonah had in his life. Down in verses 11 and 12, Jonah starts to get it. He's starting to take responsibility. Look what he says. They said to him that the sailors came to him and said, what should we do that the sea may become calm for us? And he said, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it'll calm down because it's on account of me that this has happened. He started to take responsibility, not just for what he's done, but for the consequences of his own behavior. And that's a great start. But God wants to go deeper. And he wants to go deeper in Jonah's life, and he wants to go deeper in your life, and he wants to go deeper in mine. See, when God called Jonah, and Jonah took off, his response wasn't a surprise to God. Do you know that? When God called Jonah, he knew very well how Jonah was going to react. The Bible says that God knows the beginning from the end. Every single thing that has happened in this world, that is happening, and that will happen. God knows it all. And he sees into the depths of the human heart. Listen, God knows what you and I are thinking before we know what we're thinking. God knew very well how Jonah was going to react to this. It wasn't a surprise. Jonah's reaction was God's schoolhouse. See, knowing that, Knowing he was going to run, God called him anyway. Because I believe he wanted to use his calling. He wanted to use what he knew would be Jonah's response as an opportunity to grow Jonah. It wasn't enough just that he took responsibility. Over in chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, this is how the book of Jonah ends. Then God says, to Jonah, you had compassion on the plant for which you didn't work, for which you didn't cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Now, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who don't know the difference between their right and their left as well as many animals? You see, I believe that God called Jonah not just despite his limitations, but because of them. Because God was after Jonah's heart. I think this whole thing was an object lesson in Jonah's life. He chose him specifically so that he could get to this lesson right here. Then the deep, deepest parts of Jonah's heart, there was unforgiveness. There was anger, there was hatred. God was working an incredible thing in Jonah's life. And he does the same thing for us. When you and I are asked to serve by the Lord, when he gives us spiritual gifts, and the scripture says he gives all of his children spiritual gifts, the way we use them and the fact that we use them, that's a vital part of our discipleship of our spiritual growth. We're a disciple-making church. We talk about discipleship a lot. We have our one-on-one -on -one discipleship summer season going on right now. And often when we think of that, the concept of discipleship, we think of just getting in the Bible, studying the Word, and that's a critical part. Learning how to have an effective prayer life, that's an important part. But our service is an important part. God gives us spiritual gifts, and we can't expect it just because they're spiritual gifts that we're going to be good at. And we owe it to Him, and we owe it to His kingdom to get good 
at using those gifts. It's an important part of our discipleship walk, an important part of our worship. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul speaking to his young protege, Tim, Timothy, a man that he's mentored throughout his life, he said this, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And that word discipline that he used there, it means to train, to exercise, to work out. He says, listen, you're working out. Your service is a part of you becoming more godly. It's an important part of our discipleship. And just like in Jonah's life, God uses those moments of service to chip away at areas of disobedience, to, to root out areas of doubt, areas of timid faith, to turn all of those into areas of praise. You know, many Christians in churches today in our church here at Albiano Baptist and in churches all over the world, many Christians are pulling a Jonah. God's calling them to tasks, but they're running from God. And I know that is true because the, the old saying, the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of the tasks are done by 20% of the people, that's alive and well in most churches. Many Christians are pulling a Jonah. And let me ask you this morning, what about you? What are you passionate about? What is it that you love to do very, very, in a very real way? That may be what God's spiritual gift for you is. And there are a lot of opportunities right here every week for you to get plugged in, get involved and grow in your walk with Christ. Share in the blessings of what God is doing. The question this morning is, are you doing it? Now, maybe you're joining us this morning and you say, you know, I, I can't be a part of the work of spreading God's grace and mercy because I've not experienced it myself. And if you need to talk to someone about that, or if you're a believer watching this morning, if you need to talk to someone about how you can get connected to this church family so that you can grow in your relationship with Christ and he can send you out into this community, into the world, contact me after the service. Send me an email, pastor at avianobaptist.church. Hit me up on WhatsApp. Hit me up on Facebook Messenger. We're glad you joined us this morning. I hope you stick around for a few minutes for the children's virtual lesson that will happen right after this. And then Miss Sonia will post a craft on the Facebook page later today. We're glad we had an opportunity to come together, open up the Word of God, be challenged by Jonah, the reluctant servant. Let me pray us out. And God bless you and have a wonderful week. Pray with me. Father, thank you once again, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that though you don't need us to do a single thing, you've chosen us to be your hands and feet to be the mouthpiece, to be the ones that bring a cup of cool water to this lost and dying world. And Father, I pray for everyone who's watching this virtual service this morning. You would challenge their hearts. Make it clear to them what you have gifted them to do. Make it clear to them how you want them to use it. And give them the boldness. Give them the courage to step out. To not be a reluctant servant, not to run from you, but to turn and to run with you. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Lord, we pray for your blessing on this coming week, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and have a wonderful week.